So uh, what I thought I'd do is tell something of the story of how the boat got built and, and, the, and why why we built it and why it turned into a biplane rig with uh, wing sails. And uh, then towards the end, I've got um, I made a slide of the technical detail of how the double surface inflating sails work, the rigging of the uh, of the sprit boom that goes up between them and so on. I've seen quite a few of you uh, playing around with wing sails and, and that, and uh, thought this may be a useful contribution. So, um, yeah, this uh, photo is probably 1984 or so, something like that, I think. Um, we had settled on Waiheke Island, which is um, 12 miles by ferry from Auckland, and uh, I was um, trying to make some money uh, selling drawings of my Clis Mark III design, but uh, finding that uh, making a living as a yacht designer is very difficult, if not impossible. Um, each set of plans sold involves several letters and correspondence and getting them printed and posting them and so on. And uh, you need to be selling hundreds of sets of plans to make a living out of it. So I was doing boat building and boat repair work and so on. When out of the blue, the government imposed a 20% sales tax on all boats and caravans, including partially built projects. So with one fell swoop, they killed the boat building industry in New Zealand. This was a, it was unbelievably crazy and mad. Um, many, many boat builders up sticks and went off to Australia. Some retired, the older ones and so on. I was uh, committed to living here. We bought us half acre section of land and we built a basic uh, what was originally a workshop and had turned into a house um, but uh, it's sort of this the, the family were growing up and we were bulging at the seams of our uh, little shed where we were living so um, I decided instead of building a proper house I'd uh, build a boat to, which would be a ocean going houseboat sort of thing um, I kept up to date with with uh, multi-hill design through the magazines and through the AYRS, of course. Dream was born, basically. So in terms of materials, we um, it took about a year for my business to fold up completely, and we ended up on the dole. Um, I felt if the government can ruin my business, then they can jolly well pay for it. Um, so that gave me time, but no money. And um, but on the border of our section, a half acre plot of land, was a huge tree. Uh, it's a macrocarpa, which is um, native to California, uh, Cupressus macrocarpa, uh, which grows very well in New Zealand. And uh, is when it, you get it clear of knots and shakes, it's a, a fine timber. It's almost as good as a New Zealand kauri when it's at its best. But it's worst, it's just firewood. Um, so this big tree was taking all our sun in the winter and had to come down and it had some nice straight parts to it. And I thought, ooh, there's some planking in there. And so um, we uh, bought a chainsaw with a milling attachment on it, an Alaskan mill, it's 36 inch bar saw, and this aluminum frame that clamps onto it and enables you to mill slabs of timber cutting along the grain. You put in a special kind of chain for ripping rather than cross-cutting. And uh, we, we used the visa card to buy that. The visa card had just been just been introduced. And uh, we to fell this tree, which was really quite a magnificent specimen, um, I felt there should be some kind of a mark of respect for it. And um, the old Maori traditions used to have um, chants and um, prayers and... Um, ceremonies around the felling of a tree to build a canoe and uh, so I asked the local Maori elder uh, what, what he'd, uh, whether he'd like to come around and uh, do something in the nature of offering <coughs> asking Tanes the god of the forest for his permission to take one of his children in the service of Tangaroa the god of the ocean he'd never done anything like this before but uh, he came around and uh, muttered some prayers and things and uh, we um, uh, I made a commitment there that, uh, okay, this, we're going to see this project right through. Nowadays, of course, the Maori are right into this. They've, they've re recovered their culture largely through David Lewis's um, ex uh, expose of, of their traditional navigation systems and so on. And it's, it's all a big deal. 
So we felled a tree and uh, I milled it into slabs and I built this workshop that I'm in now. So we milled this tree into slabs and um, there were on the island of Waiheke, there was no proper sawmill, but uh, there were quite a lot of these microcarpa trees that had been cut down to make room for houses and were just lying waiting to be bulldozed and burnt. And they were given to me. And uh, so I borrowed a timber jack, which is a great big heavy instrument for levering logs around that was used by the bushman. Jacked it up and uh, we would mill the timber into slabs and borrowed a friend's boat trailer and uh, I, I, I could afford a car at that stage. We had an old Holden and we'd tow these home and uh, stack them with fillets between them to air them out, let them dry for two years. And then this is the first process of getting timber out of it. You strike a chalk line down, uh, dodging the sapwood as far as you can, freehand down with a skill saw. Then you can plane up the edge straight and then you can put it through a table saw and cut it into strips. And uh, so about a third of the timber in flying carpet was obtained in this way uh, from wood grown on the island. Uh, that slide, by the way, is a, a model I made of the boat. Uh, and uh, as I couldn't afford to go any further at this stage, it sort of sat there and matured like a good wine and, uh, you know, ideas came in and uh, you could see what was going on. Um, this was a party in the new shed we built. And uh, on the right is my good friend, Arben Mackenzie, who was a Canadian guy. He was a boat builder with, with um, a small business on the banks of the St. Lawrence River. And um, each winter, the St. Lawrence River freezes solid. And he found it was cheaper to buy an air ticket to New Zealand than it was to pay his heating bills for the winter. So he'd come down here and he got inspired with my project and gave me a huge amount of help there. Um, the workshop has an earth floor and it was on a slope. So we had to dig out the top part of it and build up the bottom part of it. And um, to tamp down the floor and get it uh, firm, we organized a party and uh, told people to come in gumboots and put on some loud music and all jumped up and down on the floor and stomped it all down so they had a nice smooth floor. I love a, an earth floor because if you drop a plane on it, it won't crack and it's easy on the feet. Yeah, th this was the gumboot stomp party. And I see some of the kids playing in hammocks there as well. Um, so, yeah, milling the timber. Um, eventually, the tax was taken off and uh, boat building could start again. And I had a job building a 38-foot catamaran for a friend of mine. Um, he... Uh, we made a deal where he, he would order double quantities of cedar timber for the top sides and epoxy resin and hardener and fiberglass. And he hired a tandem trailer and brought it across to the island to double uh, one half of it for himself and half of it for me. And this was part of the deal. Um, I, unfortunately, he screwed me down on the price and I didn't make any profit on it, but I did make a wage and had some friends helping me. And uh, that gave me enough funds to get started with the building of, of uh, the flying carpet. So she strip planked. This was quite a new system that was developed in New Zealand. Um, the planking was 15 mil thick. Um, the top sides were cedar and the bottom was the microcarpa. And then it's glass both sides, um, including inside the bilges uh, all, all the way around. And each, hill, each hole was built upside down and glassed. And uh, to turn the holes over, we'd throw a party and my wife, Yacho, made a homemade ginger beer and cookies and uh, have all our friends round. And we'd pull and heave on tackles and swing her up, right side up. Um, kids found it a good playground, of course. And uh, it, we, we built one hole with eight feet of um, cabin top over, over it, uh, which would just fit inside the workshop. Uh, this was uh, the, the um, porthole being moved out of the workshop. Uh, early on, I bought the main sheet blocks and the main sheet rope, and uh, we moved it out by putting rope slings underneath and up to the beams of the workshop and all lifting on the tackles and swinging her forward and planks and rollers and levers and wedges got her out onto a... a and down the driveway and parked in the corner of the driveway for 
and uh, the porthole sat there for two years with the galley all fitted out inside it while I built the starboard hull and the centre pod. There's the porthole going down the driveway. Um, again, it was used for the, by the kids for playing in and they, they used to sleep in it in the holidays and uh, it sort of uh, yeah, just uh, sat there patiently waiting for the other half. There's the starboard hull coming out. Um, we borrowed a, a tray. This trailer was made out of an old truck chassis. Didn't have any brakes or anything, but uh, we, we um, the, our driveway is, is, is quite steep and has uh, sharp bends in it and a, a, a sharp entrance onto the road at the bottom. So it's quite a, a challenge getting out. Fortunately, I'd learnt at my father's knee moving boats on the shore of Lake Windermere as a child. At fell foot where we lived, there are old slipways and boathouses and so on. So I had these techniques and we had the, the flying carpet club. We'd round up everybody and they'd come for a party and spend a day shifting boats, shifting hulls and <laughs> in and out. A friend of mine found this tractor seized up in a paddock and bought it for $50 and got it going. Um, its brakes were very suspect, so it's got a big rope on it there, which we took around the stump of a tree and sort of surged it out and uh, very cautiously backed the hull down our driveway and onto the road and then just about 200 yards along the road to uh, the beach where we could assemble them together. And she's going down the driveway. Yeah, the port hull went on a Saturday, the starboard hull on a Sunday and fortunately the traffic cop uh, was wise enough to sleep in and not not be around to to cause any problems <laughs> while we uh, got it there. In those days, there was much less traffic on the island. Nowadays, it would be pretty chaotic if we tried this. Launching day, um, we uh, were a bit interested in, to know what the capacity was and the the, uh, the the weight of the boat. It's been just a rough estimate. And, uh, and the loading abilities. So we asked each person uh, as they came aboard to walk across the bathroom scales and log their weight. And that way we uh, we could figure out the um, pounds per inch immersion or uh, whatever you call it uh, for the holes there. Borrowed an old seagull outboard from a friend and went burling around the bay at three knots with clouds of blue smoke coming out the back. Um, Initially, I didn't have any rig for it, but uh, the Easter holidays came around, so we borrowed a, a lug sail off a Navy whaler that belongs to a friend of mine, and uh, found a jib and set up a jury mast and sailed around the island uh, over the Easter week long weekend. We found that even with this crazy rig, she would go to the six knots easily with a good following wind, and uh, it gave me confidence if ever we lost the mast, we there would be ways and means of getting getting home eventually. Um, so gradually we built the 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 masts. Each one was uh, two months of work. Um, the masts themselves. Uh, what happened as uh, so we were buying the chainsaw to do the initial milling, we went down to the agricultural field days near Hamilton in central New Zealand, and saw this chainsaw being demonstrated. And they were cutting a beautiful log of New Zealand grown Douglas fir. It was about six meters long and it was about oh nearly three feet diameter. And they were cutting this into slabs. And I thought, oh, my masts. Uh, how do you get hold of this stuff? And it was um, part of an experimental stand that was grown by the Forestry Commission uh, near Rotorua. And uh, they said, I'll just put a tender in for it after the show. So I did that. And um, Got enough timber for my masts, and the whole the whole works uh, the the whole materials for both masts cost about eighteen hundred dollars. If I'd gone for an alloy main mast, it would have been six thousand for the bare extrusion, plus your stainless steel tangs, plus your stainless steel rigging, plus your rigging screws, everything else. So um, the thinking behind the masts, I had done some sailing on a friend's. Warren catamaran, it was a 40 footer with um, a wrong given rig on it, um, a local rig. And uh, 
we found it, it, this boat had been, before he bought it, it had been le left neglected and they hadn't covered up the, the mainsail as it was stowed. The sunlight had got at it and weakened it. And so every time we got a really strong gust, the mainsail would split along the foot. And I realized that the boat is extremely stable and there's no giving it as the gust hit. You get shock loading from the gust. So I wanted the flexible element. And at that stage, there was a, a boat called the Freedom 40 had become quite popular. Um, Gary Hoyt's design, I think. It was unstayed cat catch rig with wishbone booms. And uh, that was described in great detail. And uh, it looked, uh, the unstayed mast, I, I figured would give a, a flexible element as the gust hits, the mast can flex and spill the wind and uh, absorb the shock. Um, where to step an unstayed mast in a catamaran? Well, the easiest place is down in the hulls where you've got some good berry rather than the deck. So the, the biplane rig idea came along. Um, we were still learning about the seaworthiness of catamarans and one or two of the more racy ones had been capsized by sudden gusts on the beam uh, coming down off the mountains and so on. Um, sort of killer gusts we caught catching the boat beam on with the sails sheeted hard in and just scuttling it. So I figured if you have two sails and that happens, uh, then one sail will blanket the other and it would improve the safety of the boat. Um, so uh, we went ahead. Um, uh, I also uh, got some valuable experience from a friend who built a Warham catamaran, the, the Pahi 31 design. Uh, he was building it and he saw my model and um, he was planning to do some long line fishing with it. And he figured if he put the, the two, two masts, one on each side, then he could have the middle part of the deck clear for hauling his lines. He'd pick them up on the bow and over the middle and down the stern. Um, so we uh, altered the design of his boat. We increased the beam, I redesigned the cross beams and we put a biplane rig on it. And uh, it worked very quite satisfactorily. It was difficult tacking as Warren catamarans tend to be. And um, we found it very much like the jib, but when you hung the jib off the top of the mast, it would bend alarmingly because instead of loading the mast uniformly all the way up, you um, actually put a tip load on, all the load was right on the tip. So we took his masts out and um, cut them down the middle and uh, scarfed in new pieces of wood, and beefed it all up and got the, the boat running satisfactorily. And this gave me all the information to improve again on, on my own masts. And so they were all built of four by two uh, New Zealand grown Douglas fir. And uh, there were 27 scarf joints in each mast that were all built up. Um, yeah. So um, here she is. Um, There's a photograph taken for the Boating New Zealand magazine. Um, you can see here how the uh, the two the double surface sails um, wrap around the mast and they're sewn together. Uh, if you look at the um, port side mast, you can see up the the front uh, the the lacing that holds the two halves of the sail together. Um, this is an idea I copied off Warren. Um, when you lower the mast, the the um, sail because it's in two halves, the um, lacings go slack and it bunches up easily and uh, doesn't cause too much uh, extra windage around the front of the mast when, it, when it's lowered and uh, you can adjust the fullness slightly by altering the gap between the lacing. Um, the boom you can see on the uh, starboard side there, uh, the boom goes between the two halves of the sail and uh, at this stage um, the, the new types of parachutes are coming out, which inf inflated with ram air pressure at the front. And uh, the idea of this rig was to get the sails to inflate with uh, the natural ram air pressure. So there's a big hole where the, ma the boom sticks out the front of the mast. Some of the air can flow in through there. Along the foot of the sail, uh, you can see the blue sail cover. And that is... The, four, the lower part of it is like a trough, which has the laser jacks hanging off it. And when it's properly set up, uh, this trough feeds air into the lower part of the sail and uh, blows it up. 
and uh, you can uh, uh, it, it actually creates quite a thick aerofoil which is um, supposed to be more efficient than a thin thin foil and it nicely streamlines the, the big thick masts there so um she likes the jib we, we often set a jib and uh particularly the uh, starboard side one because that's the side where the helm is and the helmsman can work the sheet winch and bring the jib in the jib gives her another knot of speed at, uh, on all points when it's on the leeward side if the jib is on the windward side then it partially blankets the leeward mainsail uh, it's still worth having it up but it, uh, it's not quite so efficient and if we're racing we can put up two jibs and uh, have an extra crew to handle it um, so um, yes she uh, we gradually went through all our trials and uh, the, uh, in 1991 we set off for Japan and uh, took a year sailing up to Japan we went via Tahiti and all through the South Pacific Islands uh, the Cook Islands and uh, Samoa and Tuvalu, Kiribati, and uh, all the way up to Japan. And then we spent two years in Japanese waters, um, trying unsuccessfully to make some money teaching English there. Um, and so, uh, so that's an, a whole uh, another story there. I, I do have a set of slides for that story if, if anyone's interested. Um, part of the objective it was uh, this I regarded as a vehicle for my two boys' education. They were 11 and 13 when we left New Zealand. And uh, as I say, we spent two years in Japanese waters <clears throat> and six months sailing back to New Zealand, nearly all of it to windward. So um, the boats proved herself really well. Um, there were some minor structural problems we met along the way, but nothing we couldn't fix. Um, the boat has a workshop in it that uh, in, inside the starboard bow. Uh, it's eight feet long. It's got a workbench and two vices, the metal work vice, the woodworking vice, and all the tools you need and epoxy and paint and spare timber. And uh, to, she was meant to be as self-sufficient as possible. Uh, apart from the electronics and the outboard, just about anything could be repaired with gear that's carried on board. And... Uh, so she worked out very well as a cruising boat. Questions? We're, we're yes. Question. Yeah. Yes. Um, I was wondering, uh, you said that you had some structural problems. Um, yeah. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, okay. Um, pounding under the bridge deck. Uh, the, the, this, uh, you have to make it stronger than you think. <laughs> they, uh, she has a centre pod very much like the, the Prout catamarans have. And in this photo, you can just see the front of it uh, under the bridge deck, painted orange. Uh, that splits the waves and it uh, gives you headroom on, in the wheelhouse um, as well. And so the idea was to, and the curves in the top sides, um, what we found was that um, a, a big flat area, it, it can get slammed by a wave, a breaking wave, and cause uh, tremendous impact forces. My thinking was, if you have curves everywhere, then... Uh, there's no big flat area and uh, any wave that hits is more likely to be deflected so um, that's why she was built with the flaring top sides and uh, the old-fashioned shear up in the bows is for running down big seas um, the on the way back from japan we ran into a typhoon uh, it was out of season it wasn't forecast but it blew hurricane force for about 24 hours um, we lay a, we initially, we had a, a parachute, but it was a, an old ex-US military one that I'd um, fished up from the wreck of the Rainbow Warrior, and uh, it uh, it all tangled and was no good. So we, we lay a hole in the worst of the weather um, with the D-shaped masts. Uh, she would make about a knot of headway with helm lashed down. She'd point her nose up into the wind about 60 degrees off the wind, between 60 and 80 degrees, and she was really quite comfortable there um as the wind swung round we got a cross sea running and we got a massive wave smashed into the um uh, port quarter of the boat uh and a, our dinghy was hanging on davits off the stern it was a big uh, 11 foot uh, dinghy the flying doormat it was called and um the davits were smashed upwards and the dinghy broke free 
Tulsa broke both the tillers and um, we tried to rescue the dinghy, but each wave would smash it against the stern or smash it against the self-steering gear. And uh, pretty soon it was, um, Bill uh, had holes smashed in it and it was full of water. And eventually we had to cut it adrift and uh, lose our beautiful dinghy. Um, much later on, I found that one bulkhead had a bit of a crack in it, in the stern. It, it was the only one that I hadn't put a, a rim around the opening in the bulkhead, the doorway through it. Normally, you, you should reinforce the rims. But that was the, the only actual major damage to the boat. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, overall, she, she's... Uh, She's stood up really well and uh, been up and down to Fiji a couple of times since the Japan voyage as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. I was just kind of curious. Mm. Can, you just, uh, can you just remind us of the dimensions of the boat? Mm. She's 11 meters long, um, 38 feet. Um, she was just under 38 feet uh, and she had transom hung rudders with, which could be lifted. The rudders also have two files on the bottom, but um, they, this meant that there were big, like dagger, dagger boxes uh, hanging out of the stern, and we found that um, in um, very strong winds, the uh, the waves would smash into the box and uh, jerk the helm around a, a lot, even though we tried lifting the rudder. Um, in fact, uh, on the, the last run back from Japan, um, the last sort of 500 miles from Norfolk Island down to the north of New Zealand. Um, we were sailing along before a rising fair wind northwesterly when there was a bang in the night and I came on deck and one of the rudders had gone to just um, probably hit something or uh, it may, may have been just worked itself loose and disappeared. So the last 300 miles we did on one rudder with a rising wind behind us and hand steering. <laughs> My two boys by this time were fully competent watch keepers and uh, they, they were, we were, fortunately were a really strong crew. Uh, so as soon as I got back, I lengthened the stern by two feet and put the rudders in boxes inside this, the new scoops at the stern. And that's improved the boat a lot. It's cleaned up the wake and uh, made her a lot better. Yeah. Uh, what kind of uh, motor has it got? What, what's your engine? Um, for the Japan voyage, we had a 9.9 .9 horse Yamaha four-stroke yeah. with the ultra-long shaft, and it goes in the back of the centre pod, and uh, we never had any trouble with it cavitating. The standard long shaft would um, it didn't work very well in anything of a seaway. It would uh, you know, uh, ventilate the propeller, and uh, that. but this uh, did us very well. It gave us four and a half knots cruising speed, and... Um, uh, but basically, if, if we had a strong headwind, then we'd motor sail into it. We, we, you couldn't, the engine wouldn't push us straight into a breeze, but we could motor sail into it. Um, yeah, the, the main use for it really was um, coming back from Japan, we hit the doldrums. It was absolutely calm. And uh, we found that we could motor at two and a half knots and the autopilot would work and uh, the even though it was flat calm you would get a, a flow of air through the boat to it with the the dome hatch open as it as it is in that photograph um they get a little a little bit of air to keep us nice and cool inside and you could go all day on a tank full of petrol there so um it just kept us a little bit of motion and a little bit happening and also in very light winds motor sailing is really effective in that uh, the, the forward speed increases your apparent wind and smooths it out so that sails can fill and the, the engine helps the sails and the sails help the engine. That's a, a nice synergy. Nowadays, we have a 25 horse outboard. Um, as we went chartering in the early 2000s in New Zealand, we needed more power to keep to a schedule. And uh, it's a Yamaha four stroke again, but uh, the 25 horse, you yeah. know, looking at the, um, starboard side the outer part of the starboard side sail with the port side removed to show all, all the ropes that go up and down in between it um so the uh the top of the sail is the start of the top um i wanted a, 
a scoop to scoop air in between the two halves of the sail and uh, you know, also was aware that the theoretical best shape for a, the tip of a wing is a semi-ellipse. So I, <clears throat> I developed these giant headboards. They're almost two meters long and uh, made of just lightweight plywood with stiffness on them and glassed. And uh, I call them elephant ears. Initially, I had the sail sewn onto the periphery of the headboard but uh, that was uh, somewhat troublesome and we, there was problems with chafe and we couldn't get the top of the sail to inflate. It was, there was too much tension on the fabric. So um, eventually uh, the, the, the best development was to sew the sail or lace the sail to the lower edge of the headboard, just like it was, was a gaff. If you visualize the, the old Dutchman's gaff, much modified. And then on the outside uh, shown dotted, uh, what I call the socks, which are a, a lighter cloth that um, is attached to all, all around the perimeter with lacings. And uh, uh, it was initially attached to the sail with Velcro, but we ended up stitching it on. And uh, that is, uh, the idea is that doesn't take any load, so it can inflate with the air pressure through there and give a nice shape to the top of the sail. And um, broadly speaking, it works quite well. Um, in order for the headboards to tip upright at the top, um, what I have is a, a line I call a, a, a snitcher, which goes um, from the lower tip of the headboard, just after the mast, down to the boom. And uh, the idea is, uh, as, as you pull back on the boom, on the snotter, as I call it, uh, to tension the sail, it pulls this line tight and that tips the headboards up upright and uh, it keeps them full. So um, the boom itself as well, um, the uh, what I call a snot or the in-haul, if you like, at the front of the boom. The procedure for hoisting the sail is to slack everything off, slack the main sheet, slack the snotter, make sure the downhaul's free, and hoist away. Um, as you get near the top, you start lifting the weight of the boom um, via this rope to the, uh, to the headboards. And so it gets to be harder work. But um, I had two teenage boys with energy to burn and uh, getting the last bit of the sail up was no trouble with two people heaving. Um, the halyards come, uh, the main halyard it starts at the headboard, goes up to the top of the mast through a block, down to the second headboard through a block, up to the top of the mast again, and then down in the back of the mast, um, if you see at the uh, the front, um, the left-hand side of the drawing, just above the boom, is a, a, a picture of the mast. It's a D-shaped mast, and the flat on the aft side has pigeon holes in it, like steps, which you can walk up. So you can, it's possible to climb the mast, um, particularly easy in harbour. Uh, you can't even climb it between the two halves of the sails when it when the sails are set. Um, and the halyards thread down there, so they can always be got at to be re-threaded and checked and so on. And then they go through a turning block on the deck and up to an old-fashioned belaying pin rail. It's known as a, a pin rail or a fife rail. And uh, so that you, you hoist, as you hoist the sail, its weight swings it forward so it doesn't catch on the mast. Um, and it's quite loose. You get it all the way to the top and then you pull back on the snotter and that tensions the, the lower part of the sail. Um, the full length buttons um, just press against a, a luff tape uh, down the edge and that's a part that's been tricky to get right. Um, you tend to get a bit of a kink where the buttons stick out. Um, the wind surfers have sorted out this problem but they don't have to lower their sails. And so, um, it, but uh, by having the, the front end of the back, it's quite flexible. Um, I, I've got, got it so it's quite a reasonable shape like that. Um, reefing the sail. Um, the reefing lines go between the two halves of the sail, so there's no windage from them. Um, the lower reef pendant is permanently rigged. And uh, we, we um, simply lower the sail as far as you can. Uh, pull down... The, the, the tack pennant is permanently rove off through the tack cringles and through the reef cringles and down again. And uh, 
you just pull that tight and tie it onto off to itself and the glue pennant to the or the leech pennant to uh, you know, pull it as tight as you can with the boom far further down uh and then retension it with it with the snotter pull pull the snotter back so um with the second reef down the foot of the sail lies along the boom the boom is like a conventional boom so of course it twists off when you ease the sheet um when it's the windward side sail that's not a problem you can vang it down and pull it down with a vang or four guy and hold it uh, pull the twist out of the sail um the leeward sail will let it twist and in, in reality at sea our first sail reduction is uh, in, particularly if it's night time and nasty weather is to drop the leeward mainsail and on the windward sail only she balances beautifully the drivers over the center of the ship and uh and it's very easy to handle but um if we were to use the double reef it's usually when you're setting out on a passage you know will be hard going to windward then you tie the reef in before you get set sail and uh, of course shaking out is no problem there so um yeah that's sort of the, uh, what, the initial expose are there any questions around that so, um what do you make your buttons from? Yeah, they were from. What are they made of? The, the button. The, the buttons. Yeah. Uh, they are fiberglass standard sail buttons. I see. Um, you can taper them by planing them with a sharp plane. Soon blows yeah. your plane. So, yeah. The, um, initially, I used the PVC pressure tubing, uh, which was much cheaper. Um, yeah. Did the job moderately well but not not ideal yeah mm. so you've got each each um side of this is a double sail so there yeah. are pairs of pairs of battens one in each side presumably that's right yes um, yes and are the are the um the leech end of the battens joined together on the two sides yes yes <clears> yes um, i i was intrigued by the possibility of opening the sails out you know to, to double the area sort of thing um i tried it on a dinghy there and i frightened myself considerably um suddenly the the loading on the mast goes from panel loading uh, uniformly distributed up the mast to tip loading and it bends like a fishing rod and uh, the sail becomes quite uncontrollable where it was done was way back in the 1930s uh, the lungstrom rig on little 22 square meter boats uh, was tried but the, in that case the uh, middle of the sail went up a luff, uh, luff groove it was attached to the mast all the way up um, it never seemed to never seemed to catch on in a big way but I tie the two ends together and they must be kept tied together um, yeah um, I have a question about the inflation of the sail um, in, in the picture that you showed of your boats under sail, I noticed yeah. that, the, that the sails weren't particularly inflated. Um, mm -hmm. And I was curious if that was standard for, for it or did they actually inflate more than that? Um, it's difficult to get the leeward sail to fill nicely uh, where we're on a reach. Um, yeah, it, uh, it's in disturbed wind from the windward sail. So basically, a reaching sail, the reaching is the weak point of this rig. Obviously, you get blanketing of one sail or the other. Um, we just ease the windward sheet out as far as you can and then oversheet the leeward sail until you've got some weight on the sheet. So you can feel it pulling a bit. Um, but uh, it's, it's far from perfection. It could do with a bit more development. But once you get the sail um, foiling nicely, then it, it, uh, it'll fill quite reasonably, yes. Can we go back and is, is that the one you're looking at or the, yes this one no no yeah. it was the one before but okay and this one i take it these are actually much more filled yeah yeah okay um so uh, <clears throat> yes it's it, uh the other thing I, i've found is that um the angle of attack of the sails is fairly critical um you, you need to get you know to keep the flow running across the sails it mustn't be oversheeted when it's oversheeted, you get uh, the, on the leeward side, you get a bubble uh, of air, and uh, the sail will sort of cave in 
uh, and, and not filled properly. So um, reaching in coastal waters, it's just uh, a very pleasant occupation to sit by the windward main sheet and play it, just keep it uh, keep the sail uh, uh, according to the gusts. Um, had a very interesting insight into um, the old Norfolk wherries uh, around there, which had a tremendous amount of twist in their sails. And I realised that when you're sailing on the Norfolk Broads, the wind direction is changing radically all the time. And no way on that big, heavy boats could he be trimming all the time. But with a, a heavily twisted sail, there's nearly always some part of it is working properly. The rest of it's all stalled out or, or luffing. And uh, in, in its way, it was really very efficient. But, uh, yeah, uh, in terms could of... Could I ask, could, could I ask the... Uh... Is there a specific dimension for letting air into the sails? Because the, the, the parafoils uh, are open all the way down the front, more or less. Yeah. And you have quite a small hole at the top, proportionately speaking. Uh, yeah, there is enough um, so pressure inside the sails to inflate them, just. Um, but uh, it's... It, uh, they, 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 they tend to... You know, the leeward side sucks out once, once you've got it foiling properly, and uh, you can get a really nice aerofoil shape on it. Um, so, I found overall it's a, a, a practical rig to use, and uh, uh, once it's all set up, but it does take quite a bit of rigging up. You need a quiet day and two people to lace the two halves together up the front of the mast and insert all the battens and so on, and uh, get the, the various ropes at the right tension. Once it's set up, then it's very straightforward. We have three ropes, downhaul, snotter, and halyard. And uh, to hoist the sails, you just cast off all three and pull on the halyard. And then you just tie one, two, and three together uh, once it's up. So uh, you know, the routine handling of the sail is, is, is very straightforward, although the initial rigging, I imagine junk rigs are the same. It take a lot of fiddling to get all the strings just to the right length, sort of thing. Yeah, you, you, you said you have to lace up the front of the sails when you hoist them. Do you have to uh, do no, that? That's, no, not, not no, every they, time. You don't have to touch the lacing normally, unless, unless it you, you get trouble with it coming undone or chafing. Hmm. Um, but uh, as I say, you can see on that mast, it looks to me as though there I could do with pulling the two uh, tack cringles together a bit tighter. They're, they're, they've spread out a wee bit there. But um, th that can be used to fine tune the fullness of the sail. Well, another interesting thing is um, we're on our third set of sails now in 25 years. Um, and uh, the earlier sails we cut with a round in the luff to throw fullness into the sail as you do with conventional sails. And they, they, it was on the advice of the sailmaker I was working with. Um, they turned out to be too full cut. And what I found best is to cut the luff straight and adjust the tension uh, on the snotter, uh, the, the tension on the boom to uh, adjust the fullness of the sail. And uh, along the foot of the sail itself, the blue sail covers have ropes sewn into the sides of them it's like a scoop with a with the top of the cover sewn onto it, and uh, the, um, the you can get those to take some of the load uh, along the foot of the sail, working much like a boom vang or cooking strap, uh, and then the the foot of the sail itself can be eased off to a nice curve and, and not be bar taut. And so, I have great fun just playing around with the sail, getting them setting nicely. Do you have any self sailing ability or system? Um. Uh, for the Japan cruise, we had a, a wind vane self-steering gear. It was designed by Bill Belcher, who lived just across the road from us. He wrote a book about it. Um, it was a servo pendulum system. Um, there was a problem uh, getting a nice clean wind onto the wind vane to, there. So we, we just had one vane and we would, as we went about uh, onto a new tack, you'd have to unship the vane and move it across to the other side. Uh, for ocean sailing, this wasn't too much of a hardship. And um, I found for coastal sailing, um, the wind vane is not really accurate enough. You want you generally want to be steering quite an accurate course. We had an electronic autopilot uh, driving the wheel, um, but uh, it was struggling a lot of the time. 
the uh, the early one was a wheel a wheel pilot. Um, later on, I went to a tiller pilot, which uh, hitches onto the tiller crossbar, um, and uh, that works really quite well. Um, up into moderate winds, it, it won't handle surfing on a big quartering sea, but uh, it'll it'll handle uh, windward work very easily. So you so, still have you still have the boat then, Bernard? Yes. Oh, um, lovely! As we got back from Japan, we we were using her just as our for holiday cruises for a few years, but she was too expensive to keep up, uh, justify. So my older son um, came back from uh, a season in the Mediterranean on super yachts, and uh, we um, put her did a major overhaul on her and refit and uh, upgrade and got her into survey for carrying uh, passengers. She could take 24 guests. Good grief. And, uh, we ran her out of Waiheke uh, during the summer months for several years. Uh, it was great fun and a lot of work, but never made any money. <laughs> uh, the island, there are no big hotels. There are several lodges and backpackers and uh, small places like that. And uh, so to fill the boat up with guests was tricky. Um, with all, we had leaflets out, the website, the whole works. You get two guests or maybe four guests and a hard day's work. And yeah. uh, you just just be above breaking even. So um, in the winters, my son went off uh, working on the uh, super yachts again and so on. Um, so there came a point where we we're going to have to sell her. But then uh, my sons and their friends said, no, you can't sell her. We have too much fun on the holidays. <laughs> <laughs> I said, right, well, come on then. And so we formed a, a limited company, a Flying Carpet Partnership Limited. Uh, which has six directors and shareholders, more or less equal shareholders. And uh, that's been running for 11 years now. And um, we just um, two weeks ago, we completed a refit. She was uh, hauled out uh, uh, on the, uh, the local boating club facility. And the bottom is now copper coated. And uh, so we, we scrubbed and burnished the copper coat and touched it up. I repainted the top sides and uh, touched it up generally. And she's back on the mooring now and uh, yeah the six partners use her uh, we uh, arrange who needs to go next and uh, it all works out fairly well except one partner lives in Fiji so he <laughs> uh, got much use of her and, uh, but um, in the long term he wants to hang on to her so, people, obviously who they, they grew up with the boat as kids with it, sailing with our kids and know the yeah. boat well and um Five of the six have children of their own now, so there's kind of an extended family of this <laughs> centered on the boat there that uh, uses her for holidays and cruises. Did you continue boat building or did you continue designing boats um, in all of this period I, to, to, uh, to actually be able to earn a living? Um, mostly repair work. Uh, and I did quite a lot of modifications. Um, Several cruising catamarans have lengthened the sterns on them. Nearly always works, improves the performance and makes a nice place to stand climbing out of the dinghy. Five are trimarans. We have, I think, five or six of them in the bay here. It must be the world's biggest centre of old five of tries. And um, quite the standard design, the keel was a bit of 4 by 2 on edge. And uh, if you try to pull them out on a slipway then it's just not strong enough to uh, it would yeah. crunch the keel and uh, squash them in or if you try to dry them out at low tide so I developed um, a wing keel um, uh, it's low, low aspect ratio a wing keel for them um, over the middle third of the hull now that the, the sun of pivers have a heavily rockered hull it's a, it's almost an arc of a circle the keel profile is like an arc of a circle from the front to the back um, I would put over the middle third of the boat uh, a solid wooden uh, fin about six to eight inches deep with um, a plate on the bottom that stuck out two inches each side and uh, that would we found was surprisingly effective in reducing leeway and improved the helm control greatly it gave the boat something to pivot against and so um, quite a few of the boats in the bay have got my keels on them. I say a bit I sailed a bit on Mike uh, Butterfield's Misty Miller, 
and frequently looked up at the float on the top. Did you ever feel yes. you wanted to float on the top for the mast? Yes. Um, early on in the, my career, uh, at the time of the boat tax, uh, when it hit, I thought, well, people can still build their own boats. And I designed a 16-foot trailer sailor catamaran, uh, eight-foot beam, so it uh, would pop on a trailer. It had a bunk in each hull and uh, a little cuddy cabin, the duet. And uh, that had a masthead float, which I made rotating so it could, and the, the, the head of the sail to slot inside the float to clean up the windage and so on. And um, we tested it out. It could tip the boat on its side and it, it, it would sit on in the float in smooth water. And by standing on the keel and leaning back on the jib sheet, I could right the boat up again. But... Um, I had a friend of mine sailing it up to town one day. To, we were actually going to a, a boat show, and taking it for me while I took my other boat. And um, it capsized in a, a breeze. And uh, as it drove to leeward in the strong wind, the sail dug into the water and, and she turned turtle despite the masthead float. So, um, Hi, Mark Tingley. Uh, he has a question and his yeah. microphone isn't working. He was asking about the glass skins, how thick and uh, whether it's cloth or biaxial or whatever. Oh, yes. Yeah, right. Okay, so the hull is basically 15 mil thick strip planks. They were 15 mil by 45 mil pla uh, planks, edge to edge glued, and all fed with um, epoxy filler. On the outside, uh, yeah, I had a. Um, uh, some special cloth uh, that had most of its. You know, the outside it was a ultra cloth. It was um, a non-woven uh, uh, straight line weave, uh, no crimp in it, stitched together uh, mat called uh, some stuff called ultra cloth that was available at the time, and um, that was you know largely to build up bulk and hardness for the outer skin and waterproofing. On the inner side, I used um, unidirectional glass run transversely. Um, where the most of the area was um, an 80-20 mix, 80% 80 of the fibres along the weft of the cloth and uh, uh, along the warp of the cloth, is it? and 20% across. And uh, I got hold of some cheap stuff that had been manufactured in New Zealand, and the, the guy had gone bust, and he had his rafters full of this stuff, and I grabbed it for a, a, a nominal price, and uh, that went in the, the parts that are not visible sort of thing. Um, the keels of the boat are um, the, a foot deep and a foot thick at their widest point, and they're an NACA uh, section, uh, uh, hydrofoil shape. And they are integral water tanks up to the floorboard level, and so they're heavily glassed on the inside to make them permanently waterproof. And uh, it's all that's all worked out really well. Yeah. Thank you. She's quite heavy as modern multi hulls go because all, all of the um, bridge deck and um, plywood bulkheads are um, construction ply, we call in, in New Zealand CD grade. Uh, one side is sanded and fair, and the other side is quite rough uh, when you buy it. Um, it's made of uh, pinus radiata plywood um, used in construction work, uh, building construction, and so on. The gluing is marine grade, but there are knot holes and rough. Uh, um, r r rough surfaces on one side and what I would do is the rough side I would run um, a power sander over it uh, lightly to knock off the high spots and then I would make a west system epoxy what are called uh, creamy bog mix uh, it put filler powder in until it can still just be poured and scraped uh, it's, it's not not uh, stiff bog and I would screed that on with wide uh, putty knife, with wide screed, screed on the whole surface of the plywood. I would do six sheets at a time and fill the grain with that and uh, then sand it all off. And uh, you had virtually marine grade plywood. Um, the the Pinus radiata is a soft, uh, softwood timber and it actually soaks up more resin than the high grade marine plywoods do. And once it's got the resin inside it, it's harder than a, a, a marine plywood. So um, it was a very cheap way to build a boat. And uh, she really cost, in terms of the 
cash that went into her, a ridiculously small amount of money for the size of boat, um, but a huge amount of labour. Personally, would like to just say thank you very, very much indeed for getting uh, this all together for us. And uh, I I'm massively impressed with all your journeys. <laughs> yes. So look forward to, to hearing the next one.